NCLEX Practice Exam for Endocrine Disorders 1 Question 1. Patient X is diagnosed with constipation. As a knowledgeable nurse, which nursing intervention is appropriate for maintaining normal bowel function? A. Assessing dietary intake. B. Decreasing fluid intake. C. Providing limited physical activity. D. Turning, coughing, and deep breathing. Answer A. Assessing dietary intake. Assessing dietary intake provides a foundation for the client's usual practices and may help determine if the client is prone to constipation or diarrhea. Limited physical activity may contribute to constipation due to decreased peristalsis. Turning, coughing and deep breathing help promote gas exchange. Fluid intake should be increased to aid bowel elimination. Question 2. A 12-year-old boy was admitted in the hospital two days ago due to hypothermia. His attending nurse, Dennis, is quite unsure about his plan of care. Which of the following nursing intervention should be included in the care of plan from the client? A. Room temperature reduction. B. Fluid restriction of 2000 milliliters slash day. C. Axillary temperature measurements every four hours. D. Antimatic agent administration. Answer A. Room temperature reduction. For patient with hypothermia, reducing the room temperature may help decrease the body temperature. Tepid baths, cool compresses and cooling blanket may also be necessary. Antipyretics, and not antimetics, are indicated to reduce fever. Oral or rectal temperature measurements are generally accepted and are more accurate than axillary measurements. Fluids should be encouraged, not restricted to compensate for insensible losses. Question 3. Tom is ready to be discharged from the medical surgical unit after five days of hospitalization. Which client statement indicates to the nurse that Tom understands the discharge teaching about cellular injury? A. I do not have to see my doctor unless I have problems. B. I can stop taking my antibiotics once I am feeling better. C. If I have redness, drainage or fever, I should call my health care provider. D. I can return to my normal activities as soon as I go home. Answer C. If I have redness, drainage, or fever, I should call my health care provider. Knowledge that redness, drainage, or fever Signs of infection associated with cellular injury require reporting indicates that the client has understood the nurse's discharge teaching. Follow-up checkups should be encouraged with an emphasis of antibiotic compliance even if the client feels better. There are usually activity limitations after cellular injury. Question 4. Nurse Katie is caring for Adam, a 22-year-old client in a long-term facility. Which nursing intervention would be appropriate when identifying nursing interventions aimed at promoting and preventing contractures? Select all that apply. A. Clustering activities to allow uninterrupted periods of rest. B. Maintaining correct body alignment at all times. C. Monitoring intake and output, using a urometer if necessary. D. Using a footbod or pillows to keep feet in correct position. E. Performing active and passive range of motion exercises. F. Weighing the client daily at the same time and in the same clothes.
Answer. B. D. E. Correct body alignment, preventing foot drop, and range of motion exercises will help prevent contractures. Clustering activities will help promote adequate rest. Monitoring intake and output and weighing the client will help maintain fluid and electrolyte balance. Question 5. A 36-year-old male client is about to be discharged from the hospital after five days due to surgery. Which intervention should be included in the home health care nurse's instructions about measures to prevent constipation? A. Discouraging the client from eating large amounts of roughage containing foods in the diet. B. Encouraging the client to use laxatives routinely to ensure adequate bowel elimination. C. Instructing the client to establish a bowel evacuation schedule that changes every day. D. Instructing the client to fill a 2-litre bottle with water every night and drink it the next day. Answer. D. Instructing the client to fill a 2-litre bottle with water every night and drink it the next day. Adequate fluids and fibre in the diet are key to preventing constipation. Having the client fill a 2-litre bottle with water every night and drink it the next day is one method for ensuring the client receives at least 2,000 millilitres of water daily. The client also should be instructed to drink any other fluids throughout the day. High fibre or roughage foods are encouraged. Laxatives should not be used routinely for bowel elimination. They should be used only as a last resort, because clients may become dependent on them. A regular bowel evacuation schedule should be established. Question 6. Mr. McPartlin suffered abrasions and lacerations after a vehicular accident. He was hospitalized and was treated for a couple of weeks. When planning care for a client with cellular injury, the nurse should consider which scientific rationale. A. Nutritional needs remain unchanged for the well-nourished adult. B. Age has an insignificant factor in cellular repair. C. The presence of infection may slow the healing process. D. Tissue with inadequate blood supply may heal faster. Answer. C. The presence of infection may slow the healing process. Infection impairs wound healing. Adequate blood supply is essential for healing. If inadequate, healing is slowed. Nutritional needs, including protein and caloric needs, increase for all clients undergoing cellular repair because adequate protein and caloric intake is essential to optimal cellular repair. Elderly clients may have decreased blood flow to the skin, organ atrophy and diminished function, and altered immunity. These conditions slow cellular repair and increase the risk of infection. Question 7. A 22-year-old lady is displaying facial grimaces during her treatment in the hospital due to burn trauma. Which nursing intervention should be included for reducing pain due to cellular injury? A. Administering anti-inflammatory agents as prescribed. B. Elevating the injured area to decrease venous return to the heart. C. Keeping the skin clean and dry. D. Applying warm packs initially to reduce sedema. Answer. A. Administering anti-inflammatory agents as prescribed. Anti-inflammatory agents help reduce sedema and relieve pressure on nerve endings, subsequently reducing pain. Elevating the injured area increases venous return to the heart. Maintaining clean, dry skin aids in preventing skin breakdown. Cool packs, not warm packs, should be used initially to cause vasoconstriction and reduce sedema. 
Question 8. Lisa, a client with altered urinary function, is under the care of Nurse Tyne. Which intervention is appropriate to include when developing a plan of care for Lisa who is experiencing urinary dribbling? A. Inserting an indwelling Foley catheter. B. Having the client perform casual exercises. C. Keeping the skin clean and dry. D. Using pads or diapers on the client. Answer B. Having the client perform casual exercises. Casual exercises, which help strengthen the muscles in the perineal area, are used to maintain urinary continence. To perform these exercises, the client tightens pelvic floor muscles for 4 seconds 10 times at least 20 times each day, stopping and starting the urinary flow. Inserting an indwelling Foley catheter increases the risk for infection and should be avoided. The nurse should encourage the client to develop a toileting schedule based on normal urinary habits. However, suggesting bathroom use every 8 hours may be too long an interval to wait. Bads or diapers should be used only as a resort. Question 9. Jun is admitted in the hospital due to bacterial pneumonia. He is febrile, diaphoretic, and his shortness of breath and asthma. Which goal is the most important for the client? A. Prevention of fluid volume excess. B. Maintenance of adequate oxygenation. C. Education about infection prevention. D. Pain reduction. Answer B. Maintenance of adequate oxygenation. For the client with asthma and infection, oxygenation is the priority. Maintaining adequate oxygenation reduces the risk of physiologic injury from cellular hypoxia, which is the leading cause of cell death. A fluid volume deficit resulting from fever and diaphoresis, not excess, is more likely for this client. No information regarding pain is provided in this scenario. Teaching about infection control is not appropriate at this time but would be appropriate before discharge. Question 10. Mang Rogelio, a 32-year-old patient, is about to be discharged from the acute care setting. Which nursing intervention is the most important to include in the plan of care? A. Stress reduction techniques. B. Home environment evaluation. C. Skin care measures. D. Participation in activities of daily living. Answer B. Home environment evaluation. After discharge. The client is responsible for his own care and health maintenance management. Discharge includes assessing the home environment for determining the client's ability to maintain his health at home. Question 11. Mrs. De La Riva is in her first trimester of pregnancy. She has been lying all day because her obgin requested her to have a complete bed rest. Which nursing intervention is appropriate when addressing the client's need to maintain skin integrity? A. Monitoring intake and output accurately. B. Instructing the client to cough and deep breathe every two hours. C. Keeping the linens dry and wrinkle-free. D. Using a footboard to maintain correct anatomic position. Answer C. Keeping the linens dry and wrinkle free. Keeping the linens dry and wrinkle free aids in preventing moisture and pressure from interfering with adequate blood supply to the tissues, helping to maintain skin integrity.
using a footboard is appropriate for maintaining normal body function position. Monitoring intake and output aids in assessing and maintaining bladder function. Coughing and deep breathing help promote gas exchange. Question 12. Maya, who is admitted in a hospital, is scheduled to have her general checkup and physical assessment. Nurse Timothy observed a reddened area over her left hip. Which should the nurse do first? A. Massage the reddened a for a few minutes. B. Notify the physician immediately. C. Arrange for a pressure relieving device. D. Turn the client to the right side for two hours. Answer. D. Turn the client to the right side for two hours. Turning the client to the right side relieves the pressure and promotes adequate blood supply to the left hip. A reddened area is never massage because this may increase the damage to the already reddened, damaged area. The healthcare provider does not need to be notified immediately. However, the healthcare provider should be informed of this finding the next time he is on the unit. Arranging for a pressure relieving device is appropriate, but this is done after the client has been turned. Question 13. Piero was noted to be displaying facial grimaces after Nurse Gara assessed his complaints of pain rated as 8 on a scale of 1 no pain 10 10 worst pain. Which intervention should the nurse do? A. Administering the client's ordered pain medication immediately. B. Using guided imagery instead of administering pain medication. C. Using therapeutic conversation to try to discourage pain medication. D. Attempting to rule out complications before administering pain medication. Answer. D. Attempting to rule out complications before administering pain medication. When intervening with a client complaining of pain, the nurse must always determine if the pain is expected pain or a complication that requires immediate nursing intervention. This must be done for administering the medication. Guided imagery should be used along with, not instead of, administration of pain medication. The nurse should medicate the client and not discourage medication. Question 14. Nurse Marthia is teaching her students about bacterial control. Which intervention is the most important factor in preventing the spread of microorganism? A. Maintenance of asepsis with indwelling catheter insertion. B. Use of masks, gowns and gloves when caring for clients with infection. C. Correct hand washing technique. D. Clean up of blood spills with sodium hydrochloride. Answer. C. Correct hand washing technique. Hand washing remains the most effective procedure for controlling microorganisms and the incidence of nosocomial infections. Aseptic technique is essential with invasive procedures, including indwelling catheters. Masks, gowns, and gloves are necessary only when the likelihood of exposure to blood or body fluids is high. Spills of blood from clients with acquired immunodeficiency syndrome should be cleaned with sodium hydrochloride. Question 15. A patient with tented skin turgor, dry mucous membranes, and decreased urinary output is under nurse Mark's care. Which nursing intervention should be included the care plan of Mark for his patient? A. Administering IV and oral fluids. B. Clustering necessary activities throughout the day. C. Assessing color, odor, and amount of sputum. D. Monitoring serum albumin and total protein levels.
Answer A. Administering IV and oral fluids. The client's assessment findings would lead the nurse to suspect that the client is dehydrated. Administering IV fluids is appropriate. Assessing sputum would be appropriate for a client with problems associated with impaired gas exchange or ineffective airway clearance. Monitoring albumin and protein levels is appropriate for clients experiencing inadequate nutrition. Clustering activities helps with energy conservation and promotes rest. Question 16. Kay Lacey is admitted in the hospital due to having lower than normal potassium level in her bloodstream. Her medical history reveals vomiting and diarrhea prior to hospitalization. Which foods should the nurse instruct the client to increase? A. Whole grains and nuts. B. Milk products and green, leafy vegetables. C. Pork products and canned vegetables. D. Orange juice and bananas. Answer. D. Orange juice and bananas. The client with hypokalemia needs to increase the intake of food high in potassium. Orange juice and bananas are high in potassium, along with raisins, apricots, avocados, beans, and potatoes. Whole grains and nuts would be encouraged for the client with hypomanzemia. Milk products and green, leafy vegetables are good sources of calcium from the client with hypoclasemia. Pork products and canned vegetables are high in sodium and are encouraged for the client with hyponatremia. Question 17. Mary Jean, a first-year nursing student, was rushed to the clinic department due to hyperventilation. Which nursing intervention is the most appropriate from the client who is subsequently developing respiratory alkalosis? A. Administering sodium chloride IV. B. Encouraging slow, deep breaths. C. Preparing to administer sodium bicarbonate. D. Administer low-flow oxygen therapy. Answer. B. Encouraging slow, deep breaths. The client who is hyperventilating and subsequently develops respiratory alkalosis is losing too much carbon dioxide. Measures that result in the retention of carbon dioxide are needed. Encourage slow, deep breathing to retain carbon dioxide and reverse respiratory alkalosis. Administering low-flow oxygen therapy is appropriate for chronic respiratory acidosis. Administering sodium bicarbonate is appropriate for treating metabolic acidosis, and administering sodium chloride is appropriate for metabolic alkalosis. Question 18. Nurse John Joseph is totaling the intake and output for Elena Reyes, a client diagnosed with septicemia who is on a clear liquid diet. The client intakes 8 ounces of apple juice, 850 milliliters of water, 2 cups of beef broth, and 900 milliliters of half normal saline solution and outputs 1,500 milliliters of urine during the shift. How many milliliters should the nurse document as the client's intake? A. 2,230. B. 2,740. C. 2,470. D. 2,320. Answer. C. 2,470. The fluid intake includes 8 ounces 240 milliliters of apple juice, 850 milliliters of water, 2 cups 480 milliliters of beef broth, and 900 milliliters of IV fluid for a total of 2,470 milliliters intake for the shift. Question 19. 
Marie Joy's lab test revealed that her serum calcium is 2.5 mcl, which is as meant data does the nurse document when a client diagnosed with hypocalcemia develops a carpal spasm after the blood pressure cuff is inflated. A. Positive Trousseau's sign. B. Positive Kvostik's sign. C. Tetany. D. Paresthesia. Answer. A. Positive Trousseau's sign. In a client with hypocalcemia, a positive Trousseau's sign refers to carpal spasm that develops usually within two to five minutes after applying and inflating a blood pressure cuff to about 20 mm Hg higher than systolic pressure on the upper arm. This spasm occurs as the blood supply to the inner nerve is obstructed. Kvostik's sign refers to twitching of the facial nerve when tapping below the earlobe. Paresthesia refers to the numbness or tingling. Tetany is a clinical manifestation of hypocalcemia denoted by tingling in the tips of the fingers around the mouth, and muscle spasms in the extremities and face. Question 20. Lab tests revealed that patient Z's is 170 mcl. Which clinical manifestation would Nurse Natty expect to assess? A. Tented skin turgor and thirst. B. Muscle twitching and tetany. C. Fruity breath and gush mouths respirations. D. Muscle weakness and paresthesia. Answer. A. Tented skin turgor and thirst. Hyponatremia refers to elevated serum sodium levels, usually above 145 mcl. Typically, the client exhibits tented skin turgor and thirst in conjunction with dry, sticky mucous membranes, lethargy, and restlessness. Muscle weakness and paresthesia are associated with hypokalemia. Fruity breath and Gushmau's respirations are associated with diabetic ketoacidosis. Muscle twitching and tetany may be seen with hypercalcemia or hyperphosphatemia. Question 21. Mang Teban has a history of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and has the following arterial blood gas results. Partial pressure of oxygen PO2, 55 mm Hg and partial pressure of carbon dioxide PCO2, 60 mm Hg. When attempting to improve the client's blood gas values through improved ventilation and oxygen therapy, which is the client's primary stimulus for breathing. A. Hypco 2 B. Low PO2 C. Normal pH D. Normal bicarbonate CO3 Answer, B. Low PO2. A chronically elevated PCO2 level above 50 mm of mercury is associated with inadequate response of the respiratory center to plasma carbon dioxide. The major stimulus to breathing then becomes hypoxia low PO2. Hypco 2 and normal pH and CO3 levels would not be the primary stimuli for breathing in this client. Question 22. A client with very dry mouth, skin and mucous membranes is diagnosed of having dehydration. Which intervention should the nurse perform when caring for a client diagnosed with fluid volume deficit? A. Assessing urinary intake and output. B. Obtaining the client's weight weekly at different times of the day. C. Monitoring arterial blood gas ABG results. D. Maintaining IV therapy at the keep vein open rate. Answer. A. 
assessing urinary intake and output. For the client with fluid volume deficit, assessing the client's urine output using the urometer if necessary is essential to ensure an output of at least 30 milliliters slash hour. The client should be weighed daily, not weekly, and at same time each day, usually in the morning. Monitoring APGs is not necessary for this client. Rather, serum electrolyte levels would most likely be evaluated. The client also would have an IV rate at least 75 milliliters slash hour, if not higher, to correct the fluid volume deficit. Question 23. Which client situation requires the nurse to discuss the importance of avoiding food high in potassium? A. 14-year-old Elena who is taking diuretics. B. 16-year-old John Joseph with ileostomy. C. 16-year-old Gabriel with metabolic acidosis. D. 18-year-old Albert who has renal disease. Answer. D. Albert who has renal disease. Clients with renal disease are predisposed to hyperkalemia and should avoid foods high in potassium. Clients receiving diuretics, with ileostomies, or with metabolic acidosis may be hypokalemic and should be encouraged to eat food high in potassium. Question 24. Genevieve is diagnosed with hypomanzemia. Which nursing intervention would be appropriate? A. Instituting seizure precaution to prevent injury. B. Instructing the client on the importance of preventing infection. C. Avoiding the use of tight tor and EK when drawing blood. D. Teaching the client the importance of early ambulation. Answer A. Instituting seizure precaution to prevent injury. Instituting seizure precaution is an appropriate intervention because the client with hypomanzemia is at risk for seizures. Hyperphosphatemia may produce changes in granulocytes, which would require the nurse to instruct the client about measures to prevent infection. Avoiding the use of a tight or an EK when drawing blood helps prevent pseudohypokalemia. Early ambulation is recommended to reduce calcium loss from bones during hospitalization. Question 25. Which electrolyte would the nurse identify as the major electrolyte responsible for determining the concentration of the extracellular fluid? A. Potassium. B. Phosphate. C. Chloride. D. Sodium. Answer, D. Sodium. Sodium is the electrolyte whose level is the primary determinant of the extracellular fluid concentration. Sodium macatine, for example, positively charged iron, is the major electrolyte in extracellular fluid. Chloride, an anion for example, negatively charged iron, is also present in extracellular fluid, but to a lesser extent. Potassium macation and phosphate anion are the major electrolytes in the intracellular fluid. Question 26. John has a potassium level of 6.5 mcl. Which medication would nurse Wilmo anticipate? A. Potassium supplements. B. Kegzalit. C. Calcium gluconate. D. Sodium tablet. Answer, B. Kegzalit. The client's potassium level is elevated, therefore, Kegzalit would be ordered to help reduce the potassium level. Kegzalit is a cation exchange resin, which can be given orally, by nasogastric tube, or by retention enema. 
potassium is drawn from the bowel and excreted through the feces. Because the client's potassium level is already elevated, potassium supplements would not be given. Neither calcium gluconate nor sodium tablets would address the client's elevated potassium level. Question 27. Which clinical manifestation would lead the nurse to suspect that a client is experiencing hypermanzemia? A. Muscle pain and acute rhabdomyolysis. B. Hot, flushed skin and diaphoresis. C. Soft tissue calcification and hyperreflexia. D. Increased respiratory rate and depth. Answer, B. Hot, flushed skin and diaphoresis. Hypermanzemia is manifested by hot, flushed skin and diaphoresis. The client also may exhibit hypertension, lethargy, drowsiness, and absent deep tendon reflexes. Muscle pain and acute rhabdomyolysis are indicative of hyperphosphatemia. Soft tissue calcification and hyperreflexia are indicative of hyperphosphatemia. Increased respiratory rate and depth are associated with metabolic acidosis. Question 28. Joshua is receiving furosemide and digoxin, which laboratory data would be the most important to assess in planning the care for the client. A. Sodium level. B. Magnesium level. C. Potassium level. D. Calcium level. Answer. C. Potassium level. Diuretics such as furosemide may deplete serum potassium, leading to hypokalemia. When the client is also taking digoxin, the subsequent hypokalemia may potentiate the action of digoxin, placing the client at risk for digoxin toxicity. Diuretic therapy may lead to the loss of other electrolytes such as sodium, but the loss of potassium in association with digoxin therapy is most important. Hypocalcemia is usually associated with inadequate vitamin D intake or synthesis, renal failure, or use of drugs such as aminoglycosides and corticosteroids. Hypomanzemia generally is associated with poor nutrition, alcoholism, and excessive GI or renal losses, not diuretic therapy. Question 29. Mr. Sale Sedo has the following arterial blood gas ABG values, pH of 7.34 partial pressure of arterial oxygen of 80 mm Hg, partial pressure of arterial carbon dioxide of 49 mm Hg, and a bicarbonate level of 24 mg L. Based on these results, which intervention should the nurse implement? A. Instructing the client to breathe slowly into a paper bag. B. Administering low-flow oxygen. C. Encouraging the client to cough and deep breathe. D. Nothing, because these ABG values are within normal limits. Answer. C. Encouraging the client to cough and deep breathe. The ABG results syndicate respiratory acidosis requiring improved ventilation and increased oxygen to the lungs. Coughing and deep breathing can accomplish this. The nurse would administer high oxygen levels because the client does not have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Breathing into a paper bag is appropriate for a client hyperventilating and experiencing respiratory alkalosis. Some action is necessary, because the ABG results are not within normal limits. Question 30. A client is diagnosed with metabolic acidosis, which would the nurse expect the healthcare provider to order? A. Potassium. B. Sodium bicarbonate. C. 
serum sodium level. D. Bronchodilator. Answer B. Sodium bicarbonate. Metabolic acidosis results from excessive absorption or retention of acid or excessive excretion of bicarbonate. A base is needed. Sodium bicarbonate is a base and is used to treat documented metabolic acidosis. Potassium, serum sodium determinations, and a bronchodilator would be inappropriate orders for this client. Question 31. Leangela's lab test just revealed that her chloride level is 96 mmHg. L. As a nurse, you would interpret this serum chloride level as A. High. B. Low. C. Within normal range. D. High normal. Answer, C. Within normal range. Normal serum concentrations of chloride range from 95 to 108 tamac, L. Question 32. Which of the following conditions is associated with elevated serum chloride levels? A. Cystitis. B. Diabetes. C. Eclampsia. D. Hypertension. Answer, C. Eclampsia. Eclampsia is associated with increased levels of serum chloride. Question 33. In the extracellular fluid, chloride is a major A. Compound B. Iron C. Anion D. Cation Answer, C. Anion. Chloride is a major anion found in the extracellular fluid. A compound occurs when two ions are bound together. Chloride is an ion, but this choice is too general. Go. 3 is a cation. Question 34. Nursing intervention for the patient with hyperphosphatemia include encouraging intake of A. Amphogel. B. Fleets of phosphosoda. C. Milk. D. Vitamin D. Answer. A. Amphogel. Administration of phosphate binders amphogel and basagel will reduce the serum phosphate levels. Question 35. Etiologies associated with hypocalcemia may include all of the following except A. Renal failure B. Inadequate intake calcium C. Metastatic bone lesions D. Vitamin D deficiency Answer C. Metastatic bone lesions. Metastatic bone lesions are associated with hypercalcemia due to accelerated bone metabolism and release of calcium into the serum. Renal failure, inadequate calcium intake, and vitamin D deficiency may cause hypocalcemia. Question 36. Which of the following findings would the nurse expect to assess in hypercalcemia? A. Prolonged QRS complex. B. Tetany. C. Fateshi. D. Urinary calculi. Answer. D. Urinary calculi. Urinary calculi may occur with hypercalcemia. Shortened. Not prolonged QRS complex would be seen in hypercalcemia. Tetany and petechia are signs of hypocalcemia.
Question 37. Which of the following is not an appropriate nursing intervention for a patient with hypocalcemia? A. Administering calcitonin. B. Administering calcium gluconate. C. Administering loop diuretics. D. Encouraging ambulation. Answer. B. Administering calcium gluconate. Calcium gluconate is used for replacement in deficiency states. Calcitonin and loop diuretics are used to lower serum calcium. Question 38. A patient in which of the following disorders is at high risk to develop hypermanzemia? A. Insulin shock. B. Hyperadrenalism. C. Nausea and vomiting. D. Renal failure. Answer. D. Renal failure. Renal failure can reduce magnesium excretion, leading to hypermanzemia. Diabetic ketoacidosis, not insulin shock, is a cause of hypermanzemia. Hypoadrenalism, not hyperadrenalism, is a cause of hypermanzemia. Nausea and vomiting lead to hypomanzemia. Question 39. Nursing interventions for a patient with hypermanzemia include administering calcium gluconate to a. Increase calcium levels b. Antagonize the cardiac effects of magnesium c. Lower calcium levels d. Lower magnesium levels Answer B. Antagonize the cardiac effects of magnesium. In a patient with hypermanzemia, administration of calcium gluconate will antagonize the cardiac effects of magnesium. Although calcium gluconate will raise serum calcium levels, that is not the purpose of administration. Calcium gluconate does not lower calcium or magnesium levels. Question 40. For a patient with hypomanzemia, which of the following medications may become toxic? A. Lasix. B. Digoxin. C. Calcium gluconate. D. Capped. Answer. B. Digoxin. In hypomanzemia, a patient on digoxin is likely to develop digitalis toxicity. Neither a nor C has toxicity as a side effect. CAPT is not a medication. Question 41. Which of the following is the most important physical assessment parameter the nurse would consider when assessing fluid and electrolyte imbalance? A. Skin turgor. B. Intake and output. C. Osmotic pressure. D. Cardiac rate and rhythm. Answer. D. Cardiac rate and rhythm. Cardiac rate and rhythm are the most important physical assessment parameter to measure. Skin turgor. Intake and output are physical assessment parameters a nurse would consider when assessing fluid and electrolyte imbalance, but choice D is the most important. Question 42. Insensible fluid losses include A. Urine B. Gastric drainage C. Bleeding D. Perspiration Answer. D. Perspiration. Perspiration and the fluid lost via the lungs are termed insensible losses. Normally, insensible losses equal about 1000 cc day. Question 43. 
which of the following intravenous solutions would be appropriate for a patient with severe hyponatremia secondary to syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone syed? A. Hypotonic solution. B. Hypotonic solution. C. Isotonic solution. D. Normatonic solution. Answer B. Hypotonic solution. When hyponatremia is severe, hypotonic solutions may be used but should be infused with caution due to the potential for development of CHF. In a syad, isotonic and hypotonic solutions are not indicated because urine output is minimal, so water is retained. This water retention dilutes serum sodium levels making the patient hyponatremic and necessitating administration of hypotonic solutions to balance sodium and water. Normatonic solutions do not exist. Question 44. Aldosterone secretion in response to fluid loss will result in which one of the following electrolyte imbalances? A. Hypokalemia. B. Hypokalemia. C. Hyponatremia. D. Hyponatremia. Answer A. Hypokalemia. Oldosterone is secreted in response to fluid loss. Oldosterone causes sodium reabsorption and potassium elimination, further exacerbating hypokalemia. Question 45. When assessing a patient for signs of fluid overload, the nurse would expect to observe A. Bounding pulse B. Flat neck veins C. Poor skin turga D. Vesicular Answer A. Bounding pulse Bounding pulse is a sign of fluid overload as more volume in the vessels causes a stronger sensation against the blood vessel walls. Flat neck veins and vesicular breath sounds are normal findings. Poor skin turga is consistent with dehydration. Question 46. The physician has ordered for a replacement of potassium for a patient with severe hypokalemia. The nurse would administer this a by rapid bolus b diluted in 100 cc over one hour c diluted in 10 cc over 10 minutes d for push answer b Diluted in 100 cc over one hour. Potassium must be well diluted and given slowly because rapid administration will cause cardiac arrest. Question 47. Which of the following findings would the nurse expect to assess in a patient with hypokalemia? A. Hypertension. B. pH below 7.35. C. Hyperglycemia. D. Hyperflexia. Answer. D. Hyperflexia. Hyperflexia is a symptom of hypokalemia. Question 48. Finn is receiving oral potassium supplements for his condition. How should the supplements be administered? A. Undiluted. B. Diluted. C. On an empty stomach. D. At bedtime. Answer. B. Diluted. Oral potassium supplements are known to irritate gastrointestinal GI mucosa and should be diluted. Question 49. Normal venous blood pH ranges from 
A. 6.8 to 7.2 B. 7.31 to 7.41 C. 7.35 to 7.45 D. 7.0 to 8.0 Answer B. 7.31 to 7.41. Normal venous blood pH ranges from 7.31 to 7.41. Normal arterial blood pH ranges from 7.35 to 7.45. Question 50. Respiratory regulation of acids and bases involves A. Hydrogen. B. Hydroxide C. Oxygen D. Carbon dioxide Answer D. Carbon dioxide Respiratory regulation of acid-base balance involves the elimination or retention of carbon dioxide. Question 51 to determine if a patient's respiratory system is functioning, the nurse would assess which of the following parameters. A. Respiratory rate. B. Pulse. C. Arterial blood gas. D. Pulse oximetry. Answer. C. Arterial blood gas. Arterial blood gases will indicate CO2 and O2 levels. This is an indication that the respiratory system is functioning. Respiratory rate can reveal data about other systems, such as the brain, making letters see a better choice. Pulse rate is not measure of respiratory status. Pulse oximetry yields oxygen saturation levels which is not a measure of acid-base balance. Question 52. Which of the following conditions is an equal decrease of extracellular fluid DCF solute and water volume? A. Hypotonic FVD B. Isotonic FVD C. Hypotonic FVD D. Isotonic FVE Answer B. Isotonic FVD. Isotonic FVD involves an equal decrease in solute concentration and water volume. Question 53. When monitoring the daily weight of a patient with fluid volume deficit FVD, the nurse is aware that fluid loss may be considered when weight loss begins to exceed A. 0.25 pounds. B. 0 0.5 0 pounds c 1 pound d 1 kilogram answer b 0 0.5 0 pounds weight loss of more than 0 0.5 0 pounds is considered to be fluid loss Question 54. Dietary recommendations for a patient with a hypotonic fluid excess should include A. Decreased sodium intake B. Increased sodium intake C. Increased fluid intake D. Intake of potassium-rich foods Answer B. Increased sodium intake. Hypotonic fluid volume excess FVE involves an increase in water volume without an increase in sodium concentration. Increased sodium intake is part of the management of this condition. Question 55. Osmotic pressure is created through the process of A. Osmosis. B. Diffusion. C. Filtration. 
D. Capillary Dynamics. Answer B. Diffusion. In diffusion, the solute moves from an area of higher concentration to one of lower concentration, creating osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is related to the process of osmosis. Filtration is created by hydrostatic pressure. Capillary dynamics are related to fluid exchange at the intravascular and interstitial levels. Question 56. A rise in arterial pressure causes the brachapters and stretch receptors to signal an inhibition of the sympathetic nervous system, resulting in A. Decreased sodium reabsorption. B. Increased sodium reabsorption. C. Decreased urine output. D. Increased urine output. Answer D. Increased urine output. Arterial brachapters and stretch receptors help maintain fluid balance by increasing urine output in response to a rise in arterial pressure. Question 57. Normal serum sodium concentration ranges from A. 120 to 125 mmHg L. B. 125 to 130 mmHg L. C. 136 to 145 mmHg. L. D. 140 to 148 mmHg. L. Answer. C. 136 to 145 mmHg. L. Normal serum sodium level ranges from 136 to 145 mmHg. L. Question 58. When assessing a patient for electrolyte balance, the nurse is aware that etiologies for hyponatremia include A. Water gain B. Diuretic therapy C. Diaphoresis D. All of the following. Answer D. All of the following. What again? Diuretic therapy and diaphoresis are etiologies of hyponatremia. Question 59. Nursing interventions for a patient with hyponatremia include A. Administering hypotonic 4 fluids. B. Encouraging water intake. C. Restricting fluid intake. D. Restricting sodium intake. Answer. C. Restricting fluid intake. Hyponatremia involves a decreased concentration of sodium in relation to fluid volume, so restricting fluid intake is indicated. Question 60. The nurse would analyze an arterial pH of 7.46 as indicating A. Acidosis B. Alkalosis C. Homeostasis D. Neutrality Answer B. Alkalosis. Alkalosis is indicated by a pH above 7.45. Thanks for watching. Please comment, like, and share.